Hi, I'm Paul Guppy. I'm Vice President for the Washington Policy Center, and I am here to give our regular weekly update about what's going on with the legislature in our state capitol and the issues and bills that they're working on that are going to affect everybody in our state. And the reason I say that is because we are down to week 15, which is the 97th legislative day of a planned 105-day session. So we're in the last 10 days, two weeks or so of the session. It does not look so far as if they will go into a longer session, but we'll see about that. As I've mentioned before, the number one job for the legislature is to pass a new two-year budget for the 2023-25 time period. The state's fiscal year starts on July 1st. So if they complete all their work on time, pass a budget, get it to the governor, then the government will keep functioning for the next two years. That is the major issue. But of course, there are dozens of other issues that are gonna affect with the lives of all of us. And that's the purpose of this update is to uh, let you know what is in the works. And some new items, two actually late breaking items related to the budget that uh, we at Washington Policy Center have noticed all through the session from January 9th until just this last week, there were no major new tax increases being proposed by the Democrats. We took that as being good news. We also pointed out that the state has billions of dollars of additional surplus, at least 8% increase in revenue over the current budget going into the next two years. So our view is the state has plenty of money. Even so, the states, uh, the Democrats in the last minute introduced two new major tax increases. The first one is to increase the real estate excise tax on uh, the sale of a home or a commercial property or an apartment house. Any real estate transaction would now be hit with a higher tax rate of 3.5% on sales above $3 million. So in the past, the real estate excise tax was a flat 1%. A few years ago, the Democrats made that a progressive tax so that real estate transactions that are worth more pay a higher tax rate, more like the, uh, the federal income tax. And then now they're increasing that again. So this fits the pattern that Washington Policy Center has consistently pointed out is that whenever a new tax is put in place or a flat tax is made into brackets with progressive progressively higher percentage tax rates, it is inevitable that lawmakers will come back in a few years once everybody gets used to that, and then they'll start cranking up the numbers. And this bill, HB 1628, is a perfect example of that. The other thing that's interesting about this bill, as Jason Mercier on our staff has pointed out, is that it was just scooted in under the 10-day deadline for introducing bills without needing a two-thirds majority of the House or the Senate to do so. So the legislature has a deadline as to when bills can be introduced, and HB 1628, which had no doubt been waiting in the wings, the sponsors of it, put it in literally a day or two before that deadline so they didn't have to meet that extra threshold. We did some comparisons of other states <clears throat> to see what the real estate excise tax is. Most other states have a flat 1% real estate tax, regardless of the amount of their transaction. And we were encouraged to see that 15 states charge no tax at all on a real estate transaction, which is a great way to make housing more affordable. <clears throat> um, our um, real estate REIT, real estate excise tax, is the highest in the nation right now. The top rate is 3%. This bill would increase that to 3.5 percent and we are tied with delaware for having the highest real estate excise tax in the country and if this bill passes we will have the highest higher than any other state and there was a good comment on this from the president of the spokane realtors association tom hormel who said in an op-ed uh, it's impossible to make something more affordable by increasing the cost of it and what he means is if you're going to tax the sale of uh, home ownership sales, you are automatically going to make home ownership more expensive. And yet, this legislative session, the Democrats have claimed that their goal is to make housing more affordable. And they have a separate bill, which has billions of dollars of subsidies and bonding in it, which they say is an affordable housing bill. Our point is why are you increasing the cost of buying a home? when you claim that you're making uh, housing more affordable. The second uh, major tax increase, which again is a surprise right at the end of the session, is a new property tax, SB 5770. <clears throat> and the way this works is, I'm sure that, it, again, Democrats have proposed this, Republicans oppose it, are, are against it. Uh, so I'm imagining that Democrat members will say, hey, I'm not voting for a tax increase here. All I'm doing is voting to increase the authority 
of local taxing districts to increase taxes every year. So what, H, what SB 5770 would do is to take the 1% limit that there is in the total increase in the total tax burden from one year to the next in any given jurisdiction and raise that limit up to 3%. So that's a massive increase in taxing authority. Again, the bill itself doesn't raise anybody's taxes, but what it does is tell every one of the 1,720 taxing districts in the state, counties, cities, uh, library districts, water districts, port authorities, that they can raise taxes. The total tax burden on their district, uh, homeowners and property owners, they can increase that amount by 3% instead of 1%. It doesn't mean that your individual taxes would go up, but the total burden is going to increase for everyone. So again, this was put right in under the deadline at the end. Um, and also what we consider to be kind of a sneaky way, the bill also calls, uh, has a provision to change uh, the definition of inflation from the CPI to the IPD, implicit price deflator. This is insider technical stuff. But again, the reason lawmakers do this is because by changing that inflation calculator in the law, it is again giving more authority to local taxing districts to increase property taxes up to the rate of inflation. Well, if the official rate of inflation that's used is higher, the result is higher taxes for everybody. And we notice that provision as well. The other problem we have with this proposal is that it overturns the will of the voters. So many people will remember that years ago, voters passed initiative 747 that passed in 2021. It got 58% of the vote huge majority, and that in play, put in place the 1% limit that this bill would repeal. We've also seen on the record that there were at least six other initiatives have been passed over the last several years. Initiative 601, referendum 47, initiative 695, I-722. All of these went in the same direction of trying to limit the amount of taxes that local and state officials can put on us. It's clearly what the, what the public wants and every single one of those ballot members measures pass by a, a wide margin. So we think those are all good arguments for why the property tax burden should be kept in place. It's growing anyway. So every year the, legis the legislature and the Department of Revenue receive billions of dollars of additional money through natural growth in the economy, the rise in property values, and that 1% increase that is allowed right now. This bill would make that 3%. So that's an update on uh, two broad new taxes that are being proposed. The next issue I'll look at is the debate over removing the Snake River dams and salmon returns. The environmentalists and uh, our Senator Patty Murray and the governor and other leading Democrats who want to remove the four federal dams that are on the Snake River uh, say that the purpose of that is to uh, help with salmon recovery. And of course, Todd Myers on our staff looks continually at fish and wildlife and NOAA data that shows fish returns are at 97, 98% every year. Uh, he pointed out that Chinook returns are as high as ever. The example that the Democrats tend to look at is the Elwha Dam near uh, Port Angeles. That was a smaller dam that was taken out. It's not needed anymore. And the river was returned to its wild state, the Elwha River. And the claim was that salmon returns were going to greatly increase. And that hasn't happened. They've mainly stayed just the way they were before. It's more information that we point out. The Snake River dams are vastly larger than the Elwha project. And they are hundreds of miles from the ocean instead of a few miles from the ocean as the Elwha Dam was. Next item is we are continuing to follow uh, falling school enrollment. Lee Finna on our staff is the statewide recognized expert on this issue, uh, being independent from the government and from school districts. She shows that 43,000 families have chosen to leave the public schools in the last two years. That's a 4% decline across the board in Washington state. But interestingly, her data shows a bigger impact on the local level. So Bellevue Public Schools are down 8%. Tacoma Public Schools attendance is down 9%. In Spokane, attendance is down 8%. In Seattle, it's down about 4%, the statewide average. But this all adds up to thousands of families that are deciding that even though it's free, that public schools are still not working for them. We know that there's a range of reasons for this, whether it's lower academic standards, the drop off in tech, in um, tech testing, uh, canceling advanced placement classes, and uh, radical cultural issues, critical race theory, 
transgender issues that are being promoted in public schools. And again, a lot of families say, what does this have to do with educating my kid? They want uh, a focus on education, which is why homeschooling, private schools, charter schools are becoming more attractive alternatives. We're also seeing, as Leaves research shows, that lawmakers in other states are responding to these same concerns. And six states have passed uh, school choice bills already. We see this growing trend. And for the first time, we see a national school choice bill was introduced by a senator whose name I don't have right here, but a senator from Louisiana who uh, introduced a bill to create a, a nationwide tax credit program, allowing $10 billion a year in tax credits so that people locally can choose a private school. The way tax credits work is that a person can donate to a nonprofit grant making organization. The donor gets a tax credit. That's the up to $10 billion for the whole country. And then the grant making organization can then use those funds to promote education for children based on the parent's choice. And that's how that mechanism works. Another um, item I'll mention is uh, a victory for property owners across the state, particularly in Eastern Washington. And that is uh, Congress has voted to block the implementation of what's called Waters of the USA regulations. This debate has been going on for 20 years. The EPA claims that under the uh, Clean Water Act of 1972, they have the authority to regulate any place that there's water in the continental United States, every stream, creek, ditch, pond, every drainage reservoirs, uh, they are claiming that waters of the USA means virtually anywhere that there's water. There was a, a family in Northern Idaho wanted to build a home. It did not touch on any body of water at all. And yet the EPA denied their ability to build because they said their, the construction would affect groundwater in the area. This case is on the way to the Supreme Court. In the meantime, Congress said uh, the government cannot implement these regulations until the Supreme Court rules on Sackett v. EPA is the name of the, of the case. We are hoping that the Sackett family prevails and that the EPA is brought under control. And the last reason that this issue is important is not only because of the vast regulatory overreach, but for the simple constitutional issue that, and the courts are starting to recognize this, that executive agencies are taking language from Congress and broadening it out into a mandate far beyond what Congress intended. So if the EPA loses this case, it will be a healthy signal back to the executive agencies that you have to have explicit authorization from Congress before you can impose these regulations on the people of the country. So <clears throat> those are the issues that we're following. Um, I'll be back next week with an update. Our um, uh, agriculture expert, uh, uh, Pam Lewison, who has a farm herself, pointed out to me that spring planting is underway and that in only 105 days, there will be corn har harvest and her community is working on that right now. She, she and her husband own a farm as well. What I noticed about that is the legislative session was also 105 days, but I think Washington's farmers are going to be a lot more productive when harvest time comes than this legislative session has been. And with that, I will be back uh, next week with another update. Thanks.